Welcome to the neurologic system. The schematic shows the division of the central nervous system, or CNS, plus the peripheral nervous system, or the PNS, and you can follow the YouTube links for more pathophysiology. Let's first look at the outer layer of the CNS, the outer layer of the brain specifically. We have the cerebral cortex plus the four lobes, the frontal, the parietal, the occipital, and the temporal lobes. In the cere uh, cerebral cortex, we have the cerebrum's outer layer of nerve cells. This helps to function our thought, our memory, ability to reason, our ability to feel sensation, and coordinates our voluntary movement. Each half of the cerebrum is considered a hemisphere, and each of those hemispheres are divided into four lobes. So we have the frontal, the parietal, the temporal, and the occipital lobes. Lobes have areas that mediate specific functions. For instance, the frontal lobe, this helps with personality, behavior, emotions, and all our intellectual functioning. The parietal lobe, this is where you see the postcentral gyrus. This is a primary center for sensation. And remember, a gyri is a bulge in the cortex. The occipital lobe is the primary center for visual reception. And the temporal lobe, which is behind the ear, has the primary regulation of auditory reception taste and smell. Additionally, we have two areas called Wernicke's and Broca's. And in Wernicke's, which is located at the temporal lobe, it's associated with language comprehension. For example, if the Wernicke's area is damaged, then we have receptive aphasia. This is when your patient might hear a word but the word has no meaning to them. It's like hearing a foreign language or hearing garble. They don't understand. So it's receptive aphasia. Whereas Broca's aphasia has to do with the motor component of speech. If this area is injured, we have expressive aphasia. This means that the person cannot mechanically talk. They can understand language and they know what you're talking about and they know what they want to say, but they cannot produce the sounds. Now damage to specific cortical areas will produce some type of corresponding loss of function. Motor weakness, paralysis, they may not be able to have full sensation, and then of course the impaired ability to understand and process language. Now let's look at the inner layers of the brain. We have the basal ganglia. This is gray matter, and it's within the two cerebral hemispheres. This forms the subcortical association of the motor system, or the extrapyramidal system. This area initiates and coordinates body movement, controls autonomic association of the body. Whereas the thalamus, this is the relay station. This is where the sensory pathways of the spinal cord, also the cerebellum, and the brainstem form synapses. The hypothalamus, this is our respiration center. We have many functions here, such as appetite, sex drive, temperature regulation, heart rate, blood pressure. It regulates sleep. It also regulates our anterior and posterior pituitary gland and it coordinates the autonomic nervous system. So again, our stress response and our emotional status. Then we have the cerebellum. This is that coiled structure located on the occipital lobe, and this is the center for the coordination of voluntary movements, our balance and equilibrium, and also our muscle tone. It doesn't initiate 
However, it coordinates smooth movements. So think about the muscles needed in playing the piano, muscles needed in juggling, fine motor skills, cutting paper, swimming. It adjusts and corrects voluntary movements, but it operates entirely below conscious level. More specifically, the brainstem, where we have the central core of the brain, and it consists of nerve fibers. We have our cranial nerves. Three to 12 actually originate from the nuclei of the brain stem itself. And so you can see the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. The midbrain contains motor neurons and tracts. It helps with vision, hearing, eye movement, and body movement. The pons helps with motor control and sensory analysis. And the medulla oblongata maintains our vital body functions. It helps regulate our breathing, our heart, blood vessels, digestion, sneezing, swallowing. And it's a part of the brain that is the center for respiration as well as circulation. For those of you that are more visual learners, you can use this slide to help understand the different functions of the areas of the brain. And we have one Let's look at the pathways of the CNS, and this is helpful to understand if you see a deficiency, what may be the problem or where in the brain is being affected. We have to understand the terminology cross representation. This is when, for instance, the left cerebral cortex is going to receive the information of the right side of the body. So the left side gets sensory information from the motor functions on the right side and vice versa. So knowing where these fibers cross midline, this is really gonna help you interpret your clinical findings when examining your patient. The spinal thalamic, also called anterior lateral tract, contains these sensory fibers and it transmits pain, temperature, itch, crude touch, not precise location of touch. These fibers carry pain and temp sensations. They ascend in the lateral tract where crude touch is formed through the more anterior tract. At the level of the thalamus, the fiber synapses with the third sensory neuron, and this carries a message to the sensory cortex for full interpretation of the senses. In the posterior columns, these fibers conduct sensation of position, vibration, and really fine localized touch. For instance, if someone pokes you with a paper clip, you would know where you're being poked. It also mediates position or proprioception. So without looking, you know where your body parts are in space in relation to one another. 
So if someone asked you to close your eyes and move and they moved your hand up over your head, you would know even with your eyes closed that your hand is moved up above your head. The posterior or dorsal column is also in charge of vibration. You can feel vibrating objects. So if you take a tuning fork and put it on your patient's big toe, their eyes are closed, they would be able to sense that vibration. And also stereognosis, which is fine localized touch. Without looking, if someone puts an object into your hand, you would be able to feel it and understand what it is that you are touching. The spinal thalamic tract, this is the tract that helps you to understand the sensation of pain. It helps you to understand temperature. If someone puts an ice cube on your hand versus maybe a heat pack in your hand, you'd be able to tell the difference. Crude and light touch. In the posterior dorsal column, this is a sensation of position vibration, and fine localized touch. This slide is a review of the previous slide, but helping you to organize it within the two different tracks. This will become important as we learn in the objective section of this lecture how to examine for spinothalamic and dorsal column tracks. You also see the motor pathways of the pyramidal tract, which is your ability to write, fine movement, and the extrapyramidal tracts, which is more gross movement or gross motor, which is walking, jumping, running. And again, the word cerebellum has two L's for balance, movement, equilibrium, posture. And quickly reviewing the peripheral nervous system, the 12 cranial nerves, that we have talked at length about, and then the 31 spinal nerves. You can see that the 31 spinal nerves arise from the length of the spinal cord and it supplies the rest of the body. The spinal nerves are named based on the region which they exist. So we have eight cervical spinal nerves, 12 thoracic spinal nerves, five lumbar, five sacral, and one coccygeal. Now each innervates a particular segment of the body, which you can see in this dermatome chart. This chart helps you to understand what may be the root of your patient's chief complaint of pain um, or maybe tingling sensation. If someone says there's a tingling sensation in their thumb, I don't assume that it's just the thumb or the hand that's being affected. I'm going to follow the dermatome chart and realize that this is at the level of C8. If someone is complaining about, let's say, um, lateral leg pain near their ankle, I wouldn't just assume it's the leg, but I would trace it back to S1 of the spinal cord area. So not to say that it's always going to follow this dermatome because there may be other factors involved. Maybe the pain is actually because there's a lesion in that anatomical area versus a spinal deficiency or a nerve deficiency but this is very helpful in understanding where the root of the cause of the sensation or pain is located. Look at the four types of reflexes. We have the deep tendon reflexes or myotactic. This is what most people associate reflexes with. You think of the knee jerk reflex, also called the patellar reflex. We have the superficial reflexes. This is the corneal light reflex or the abdominal reflex. Visceral or organ reflex. This is your pupillary response to light and accommodation. And pathological, meaning abnormal reflexes such as the Babinski or the plantar reflex. Noting the difference between the Babinski and the plantar. 
Now, with the Babinski reflex, this is a term that we typically use with infants. And when we do the Babinski reflex, we are taking a sharp object, usually I just use the bottom of my reflex hammer, and I move it up towards the pinky and then around to the big toe in kind of like an upside down candy cane pattern. And what we expect to see in an infant is that the toes will fan out in response to the external stimulation. And this is an, a primitive reflex. Versus the plantar reflex in the adult. It's exact same motion, but with an adult, the expectation is that they're actually toes fanning downwards or flexing inwards towards the floor. Therefore, it's called the plantar reflex. You're planting your foot downwards. And so if we see toes flexing outward in an adult, this may help us to realize that there's some type of spinal cord injury or deficiency causing this reflex to operate in the opposite manner. Again, the Babinski reflex, we are expecting toes to fan upward in an infant, but the plantar reflex, we are expecting toes to flex downward or inward on an adult. So let's look right now at the components of a deep tendon reflex or DTR. We have five components. We have the afferent, which is the intact sensory nerve. We also have the functional synapse in the spinal cord itself. Efferent, we have intact motor nerve, a neuromuscular junction, and we have to have a competent muscle. All these components have to be coordinating in order to have a reflexive reflex. Let's look at the short video. We're moving on to the autonomic nervous system now. The peripheral nervous system is composed of cranial nerves and spinal nerves, we know, and they carry fibers divided functionally into two parts. We have the somatic, voluntary, and the autonomic, our involuntary. Our autonomic system mediates unconscious activities. So think about um, our movements of our muscles, cardiac muscles, and our glands. So I mentioned in previous slide the term dermatome. These are the circumscribed skin areas that supplied mainly from one spinal cord segment through a particular nerve. Some dermatomes overlap if one nerve is severed, most of the sensations are then transmitted by one above or one below. So they help to compensate. But we do use these useful landmarks of the dermatone to help us understand the body's functioning and sensation. C6, 7, and 8 equate to the thumb, middle finger, and fifth finger. Anywhere in the axilla area is T1. You can see the nipple area is at the dermatone of T4, umbilicus at T10, the groin at L1, and the knee at L4. And so although there are many more levels, these are landmarks that help you to understand the vicinity of the other levels. You can also use the autonomic nervous system chart here to understand what levels are associated to what glands and what organs. We're going to switch gears quickly to the structure and function, thinking about developmental competence of infants. Again, we mentioned earlier primitive reflexes, and this is an indication of CNS function. Now, when we have persistent of primitive reflexes, so beyond where we expect them to be, then this can be an indication of central nervous system dysfunction. So you really have to understand when the primitive reflex is supposed to end. Now this won't be tested in this class, but you may be tested in third semester. 
sensory motor development proceed with the gradual acquisition of myelin. And so in the beginning, let's say if you're a premature infant and you're at 25 weeks premature, you don't have the same amount of myelin as a term infant, 37 to 40 weeks. Therefore, even the slightest touch could create a very um, jumbled and very excruciating pain sensation versus what maybe the provider or patient's family is trying to do by touching or you know rubbing the arm of the patient or trying to um, gently pat the patient at a 25 weeks old your brain is not able to understand this sensation and so it causes pain instead of comfort again it has to do with myelin development babies are born with a set of reflexes critical for survival in the outside world some of these world. reflexes are so obvious some of these reflexes are so to look obvious for them. You might such as the breathing reflex or the eye blink reflex or the eye blink reflex Rooting is one of the most critical reflexes. Is one of the most critical by reflexes. touching four-week-old Lily's by cheek, touching she'll turn her head and open her mouth in preparation for nursing. Once the baby is in contact with a Once breast, the baby is a bottle, or even a finger, a breast, a the sucking reflex finger, takes over. The sucking reflex takes over. Involuntary at first, the neonate will gradually gain control over sucking during the first year. over sucking during the first year. Placing liquid in the mouth will induce Placing the swallowing in the reflex. Will induce the swallowing reflex. In the first few weeks of life, in the it first takes few all weeks the baby's life, concentration it takes just to control these various uncoordinated reflexes. Just to control these various uncoordinated At this age, feeding Julia can At take over age, an hour. An hour. Take over after an about hour. six weeks, though, after Julia about six will be weeks, pro. though, Julia will be a pro. I'm going to let you finish the rest of that video showing primitive reflexes. Now we're looking at developmental components of an aging adult. As we get older, we do expect some atrophy to occur. And this is due to a steady loss of neuronic structure in the brain and spinal cord. So what we'll see is a loss of weight and volume in the cerebral cortex, and we'll start to have some thinning. This reduced subcortical brain structure and expansion of the ventricles will lead to the atrophy of the muscles and therefore also the decline of the neurologic function. Usually with people over age 65, we'll start to see a decrease in muscle bulk, tone in their face, their neck, tone around their spine. They'll have decreased muscle strength, decreased agility, coordination, vibratory senses, and we might even see a decrease Achilles reflex. Irregular pupil shape, decreased pupillary reflexes, and meiosis of the pupil. We think about neurological issues. Um, in terms of cultural competence, we need to understand what segments of our population have a higher risk for increased blood pressure, um, therefore increased stroke risk, and you can see that we have um, a problem just in the U.S. alone without even looking at the global issue. Just within the U.S., 
cardiovascular disease is the highest cause of death. And we look here in these eight states that you can see on this picture, this is called the stroke belt, where we have increased areas of hypertensive patients and therefore, again, at risk for stroke. And we're bringing this into our neurologic lecture, even though it's part of the cardiovascular system, because of the impairment to the neurologic system if a stroke occurs. We're moving on to the subjective data now. What are our health history questions? If we're looking at this in terms of a focus assessment, I'm usually asking my patients about their history of headache, the severity and the frequency. And then of course, you, you are going to old cart any of these issues. I'm listening for the term, this is the worst headache in my life. I've never had so much pain. This refers, um, the, or excuse me, this requires a referral, uh, specifically, probably an emergency. If it is the worst headache, we are worried about a possible stroke. Whether it's ischemic or hemorrhagic is to be determined, but you do want to pay attention to your patients when they say, something in that vein. I also want to know about head injury. Has there been any type of trauma? What caused the trauma? When did it occur? Sometimes people don't come right away. Things I'm looking for are maybe signs of concussion. So I'll ask them, you know, was there a direct blow? Um, did you feel like there was a rotation of your neck? Um, where did it happen? How long ago? And what was the severity? Did you lose consciousness? I'm asking about dizziness and vertigo. Questions I'll say, um, you know, do you ever feel lightheaded? Do you have this weird moving sensation? Do you feel faint? Um, instead of using the term syncope, um, you wanna ask again about the loss of consciousness as well. Remember the difference between vertigo and dizziness. True vertigo is rotational spinning caused by the neurologic uh, system or, or a neurologic disease, and this occurs in the vestibular apparatus of the ear or the nuclei in the brainstem. I'm asking if there have been any signs of convulsions or seizures. Um, do they have a history of epilepsy? Maybe they have had a loss of consciousness. They noted some involuntary muscle movements or, or somebody noticed that of them of the patient and you're asking if there was any sensory disturbances. Aura is a subjective sensation that precedes a seizure. It also is associated with long-term migraines as well. And auras can be auditory, visual, or motor sensations. Um, you're asking about tremors, involuntary shaking, vibration, trembling. Weakness, you wanna know, is it generalized weakness all over or is it a localized body part? And does it occur with anything? Is it um, with voluntary movement or involuntary movement? I'm asking about coordination. Um, are they having problems with balance, walking? Have they fell? You, sometimes you can ask the patient, you know, does it seem like your legs are giving way on you or are you feeling more clumsy than usual? And of course you wanna know the onset of that using old cart. Dysmetria, this term means it's the inability to control the distance of power or the speed of your muscular actions. And sometimes with chronic neurologic diseases, your patients will exhibit signs of dysmetria. Ask about numbness and tingling. Uh, paresthesia is this abnormal sensation. Maybe they have this burning or tingling in their peripheral um, toes or fingers, arms and legs. Ask about difficulty swallowing. And is it with solids or is it with liquids? What type of foods cause this difficulty? Is it all the time? Do you have excessive saliva or feel like you're drooling? Is there a difficulty with speech? And when you talk about 
difficulty with speech, you want to know, are you having difficulty with forming your actual words, which is called dysarthria? Or is it difficulty with language comprehension or expression, which is dysphagia? And then you want to know any significant history, Sp stroke, spinal cord injury, have they ever been infected with meningitis or encephalitis? Do they have a congenital defect? Do they have a history of alcoholism or illicit drug abuse as well? And then lastly, you want to ask about environmental or occupational hazards. Uh, think about some occupations that increase your risk of neurologic damage. Um, it could be something as, you know, as obvious as someone that has a dangerous job, like maybe they ride uh, ATV vehicles for a living, or they're a BMX bike performer, or maybe they're a football player. But also, occupational hazards can include people that work with incest insecticides, um, or solvents, or maybe even lead. You think about paint, construction workers. Um, I would even say students and office workers are at risk in some instances. There is this term called new building syndrome and new building syndrome is when you go into an area of work or leisure and they've just put in new um, carpet, new paint, new flooring, and all of these things off gas the materials. You think of the glues in the flooring or the solvents in the paint and you want to make sure that um, if they're exhibiting new signs or symptoms when they're in this new work area, work environment, um, or maybe even after a remodel, that these vague symptoms of fatigue or difficulty breathing, these might actually be from new building syndrome. And then medications, you know, asking what types of medications your patients are on. For children, I'm asking about their reflexes. I'm asking their parents, are they meeting those developmental milestones? Do they have trouble with balance? Um, are, is there any progressive muscle weakness? Were they able to walk steadily before and now they're bumping into things? So, you know, what was their baseline? And then what is happening now? Again, you're going to get more information here in your PEATS. You also want to ask about a history of seizures. Were they associated to high fever? Were there loss of consciousness? Again, with the motor and developmental milestones. And then what environmental exposures do they have? Lastly, I'll ask about family history of cerebral palsy, which sometimes can occur because of interventricular hemorrhages in a premature infant. Um, also, I'm asking about seizure disorders and any other types of musculoskeletal disease processes such as muscular dystrophy. With my aging adults, I tend to ask about dizziness because as we get older, this tends to be one of the more frequent complaints. Same thing, headache, head injury, vertigo, dizziness, seizures, tremors, and weakness. All of those things you're going to ask again. And I'm also going to pinpoint and hone in on safety modifications in their home. Just thinking about fall risks and their ability to perform ADLs. You're going to ask about memory function, mental function, mental health. Uh, do they have any tremors or notice any tremors? You want to know their alcohol history, not just presently, but previous. They remember an oldie but goodie was once a young person as well. So what do they do in their past life? And has there been any sudden vis vision changes, any signs of blindness, weakness, loss of consciousness, loss of coordination? the objective data. So the actual physical exam. And so with the comprehensive neurologic exam, we are testing the cranial nerves while assessing the head and neck already.
we test the superficial abdominal reflexes when we're assessing the abdomen. We're going to record all the neurologic data together as one functional unit. Remembering that the complete neurologic exam also includes the mental status of the patient, which we covered earlier in the semester. So think of your ABCT. We are going to also include motor system, sensory system, and reflexes. And you can see the different types of equipment here that you might need to use. Quickly looking at the cranial nerves, please um, review again. We have been talking about this over the last three weeks Hi or so. My name's Andrew, one of the final year seen the students. one minute so cranial nerve exam, exam separate yeah, from Brown, the neurologic exam. Nice to meet you, you want to be able to Today perform both the cranial, cranial nerves, nerves within a full head to toe, but also if you were okay? needing to yeah, isolate fine. just Brilliant. cranial nerves 1 to 12, how would you do that and put that together? First of all, Robert, I'd just like to check have you noticed any change in your sense of smell at all? No, I haven't. Now I'd like to test your vision, would that be okay? That's fine. I'd now like to assess your visual acuity. Do you usually wear glasses, Robert? No. Okay, if you could cover one eye with the palm of that hand, and starting at the top, I'd like you to read down as far as you can on the Snellen chart in front of you. E. H N D F N P T X Z U Z D T F D F N P T H P H U N T D Z N P X T Z F H. Fantastic. And if you could cover the other eye and do the same. E H N D F N P T X Z U Z D T F D F N P T H P H U N T D Z N P X T Z F H. Brilliant. I'd now like to assess your pupils. This will involve shining a bright light into your eyes. Would that be okay? Yes. Brilliant. If you could just pick a point on the wall in front of you and keep looking at that. That's great. I'd now like to swing the light between your eyes. If you just keep looking at the point on the wall in front of you. Finally, I'd like to assess the ability of your eyes to focus. If you could look at the point on the wall in front of you. And now look at the pen. That's great. Robert, I'd now like to do some specific tests of your vision. If you could just keep looking into my eyes, I'd like you to point at the finger you see moving. To test your visual fields. If you could just cover one eye with the palm of that hand for me, I'm going to cover the opposite eye. Let me know when you see my finger moving. Keep looking into my open eye. Yes. 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 Cover the opposite eye for me. Same again. Yes. 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 Brilliant. I'd now like to assess the movements of your eyes. First of all, have you got any double vision at the moment? No. Okay. 
do let me know if you have any double vision throughout the exam. But I need you to keep your head perfectly still and I'd like you to follow my finger. Do you have any double vision at all? No. Okay, fantastic. Okay, now I'd like to assess the sensation on your face. First of all, I'll start with a piece of cotton wool and then a small newer tip. Would that be okay? Yes. Brilliant. This is what the cotton wool feels like. Can you feel that? Mm -hmm. Brilliant. If you could just close your eyes and let me know when you feel the cotton wool on your face. No. 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 And did it feel the same on both sides of your face? Yes, it did. That's great. I'm now going to assess it with this newer tip. Can you feel that? Yes. Fantastic. Again, if you could close your eyes for me. And again, did it feel the same on both sides? Yes, it did. That's great. Okay, I'm now going to feel some of the muscles around your face now. Just clench your jaw for me and relax. Clench your jaw for me and relax. Open your mouth and don't let me close it. I'm now going to assess a reflex, if that's okay. What I'd like you to do is just relax your jaw down slightly for me. I'm just going to place my finger on your chin. Fantastic. So I'd just like to assess some movements of facial expression now, Robert. First of all, can you start by raising your eyebrows? Great. And now if you can close your eyes as tight as you can and don't let me open them. If you can puff out your cheeks, don't let me push them in. If you can purse your lips for me and bare your teeth. That's great, thank you. Two quick questions for you, Robert. Firstly, have you noticed any change in your taste at all? No. Okay. And secondly, have you noticed that your hearing sounds louder than usual? No. Good. Robert, I'd now like to assess your hearing if that's okay. To start with, I'm going to place one hand on one ear and I'm going to whisper a number or a word into the other ear. I'd just like you to repeat it. Okay. okay. Sixty-six. 79. Fantastic. And just the same on the other side. 83. 97. That's great. So I'm now going to use the tuning forks to assess your hearing. First of all, I'm going to place the tuning fork on the bone behind your ear. I'd like you to let me know whether you can hear it and when you stop hearing it. Okay. Can you hear that? Yes. Let me know when it stops. It stopped. And can you hear that? Yes. I'm just going to do the same on the other side. So I'm now going to place the tuning fork in the middle of your forehead. Can you hear that, Robert? Yes. And is it loudest in one ear or the other or in the middle? In the middle. That's great. I'd now like to assess the nerve that assists with your balance. 
And now I've got you standing up. What I'd like you to do is close your eyes and I'd like you to march on the spot for me. That's great, you can stop now. Robert, if you could just cough for me. <clears throat> Finally, if you could just take a sip of this water. And when you're ready, swallow. So now I'd like to just assess the power in your shoulders and your neck. Robert, if you could just start by shrugging your shoulders for me and don't let me push them down. Fantastic. Now if you could turn your head to the right against my hand and don't let me stop you. Fantastic. Turn your head to the left against my hand and don't let me stop you. That's brilliant. So I'd now like to examine your tongue. First of all, if you can just open your mouth for me. That's brilliant. And if you can stick your tongue out. Fantastic. Now if you can just press your tongue into my fingers and the same on the other side. Today I did a cranial nerve exam on Robert Brown, a 21 year old male. On examination of cranial nerves one to 12, there were no abnormalities detected. To complete my examination, I'd like to do a motor and sensory exam of both the upper and lower limbs. Part of testing the motor system of the neurologic exam is inspecting and palpating the muscle just for size and strength and you're checking bilaterally for tone and any involuntary movements. You are going to compare the right side and the left side and each muscle group should be within the normal limits for their age. They again should be symmetric bilaterally. If you do find muscles that are asymmetric you want to measure with centimeters and then record the difference in your charting. The difference of one centimeter or less is not significant. Sometimes it's difficult to assess muscle mass uh, depending on the habitus of your patient. So you do the best that you can. You're also testing for strength. All the muscle groups of each extremity, the neck and the trunk tone you want to test this when there's normal tension in a relaxed muscle so you want to ask your patient to relax completely and then move each extremity smoothly through a full range of motion normally you would note any mild or even resistance to any movement and then involuntary movements you're going to ask um, to see if there's any present involuntary movements when you're inspecting when you document, you want to know the location of these movements, the frequency, the rate, and if the movement appears to be controlled at will. Then there's tests of the cerebellar function. First, we test for balance, and this is tested by asking the patient to walk 10 to 12 feet, turn around. We're observing the gait. Is it smooth, rhythmic, and effortless? Then we want to ask the person to walk about 15 inches from heel to heel. This is tandem walking. And normally the person can walk straight and still stay balanced with heel to heel or heel to toe, tandem walking. Then you're going to ask them to perform Romberg's test. This is when you put your feet together, your arms to the side, and they should be able to hold this position for 20 to 30 seconds. Your patient should be able to perform a shallow knee bend or they can hop in place on one leg and then the other. Now, obviously there are gonna be some older patients or patients with musculoskeletal limitations that you wouldn't perform this on. So you have to use your nursing judgment and whether it's appropriate or not. 
Then we have the coordination and skilled movements. We have rapid alternating movements. So you ask your patient to pat their knees with both hands lifted up and then down and then up and then down and then faster and faster. They should be able to do this in a quick rhythmic pace. You can also alternatively ask the person to touch the thumb to each of their fingers and then again with the other hand and then reverse the um, the action. So you can start with the pointer finger going to the pinky and then the pinky going to the pointer finger. This should be done quickly and accurately on both hands. The finger to finger test. With eyes open, you're gonna ask the person to use their index finger and touch your finger. And you are going to move your finger in different areas in front of you. And they're gonna put their finger to your finger and then to their nose and then back to the finger and then back to your nose. You can also do the heel to shin test where you have your patient laying supine and you're going to place their heel on the opposite knee and then you're going to ask them to run it down their shin to the ankle or they can put their own heel on the opposite knee. You do it both sides and they should be able to have a very coordinated movement and it should be in a straight line down their shin.
testing the spinal thalamic tract. We're now more specifically going to look at the deep tendon reflexes. We can test the stretch or deep tendon reflexes by using a reflex hammer. Uh, one should have been provided in the APU clinical uh, supply bag, and if not, you can just buy a cheap one on Amazon. If you are having trouble with the normal Taylor hammer, what we usually see or recognize as a reflex hammer, you can always use a Queen's hammer too. In the Stanford 25 video that is also linked to this PowerPoint page, you can see that the neurologist is using a Queen's hammer, which has a little bit more flexibility. When you're testing the deep tendon reflexes, you want to also note the grading components. Zero is no response, moving to a one plus, meaning that there's a low normal response, slightly diminished. A two plus is average and normal. Three plus is brisker than average, and it may indicate that there might be some type of disease processes, and four plus is very brisk and hyperactive, sometimes with clonus, and is indicative of disease. In most electronic medical records, you'll see that two to three plus is on average what a facility might consider normal. So by all means, you need to refer back to your facility and see what their grading policy is, but typically we use zero to four plus. Now I did mention four plus being hyperactive with clonus. And clonus is a term that we use to describe um, the rapid rhythmic contractions that occur with the calf muscles and the movement of the foot when we are testing for the lower Achilles reflex, which is at, at the level of L5 and S2. It's also sometimes called the ankle jerk reflex. To do this, you would support the lower leg of your patient in one hand, and in the other hand, you'd move the foot up and down, trying to relax the muscle first. Then you stretch the muscle by very briskly dorsal flexing the foot, and you hold that stretch. When you release it, you shouldn't see any further movement. Again, if there's clonus, you're gonna see that rapid rhythmic contraction. Let's start from the top now with the biceps reflex. With the biceps reflex, we're looking for a normal response in the contraction of the bicep muscle itself with flexion of the forearm. To do this, you're gonna support your patient's forearm onto yours. You're going to place your thumb on the biceps tendon and you're going to strike your own thumb with the reflex hammer. With the triceps reflex at the level of C7 and C8, you're going to tell the person to let their arm dangle. You want to feel that dead weight um, suspended in air. And as you strike that triceps tendon directly just above the elbow, you should see extension of the forearm. The brachioradialis reflex, C5 and C6, you hold your person's thumb to suspend the forearm in relaxation and you're gonna just strike the forearm directly about three centimeters over that radial area, also called the radial styloid process you should see a bit of flexion and supination of the forearm. The quadriceps reflex, also called the knee jerk reflex, is at the level of L2 and L4. You want your patient to dangle their leg, so you have to make sure that if they're on a hospital bed or a clinic bed, you need to raise the bed up so that it's dangling and not touching the floor itself. You wanna stretch those tendons strike the tendon directly just below the patella. And you should see a slight extension of the lower leg, but more importantly, you're trying to look to see if that quad muscle itself will create a jerk response or a um, contraction of the quad muscle. 
and we talked about the Achilles reflex. So I want to draw your attention to not only the name of the reflex, but the level of the spinal cord that it mediates to. Um, and this will help you determine where you suspect there to be maybe a lesion or a neurological disease process occurring.
There are some superficial reflexes as well. The three reflexes that I want you to understand are the abdominal reflex, chromosteric reflex, and the plantar reflex. The abdominal reflex, we did not do with the abdominal exam. However, I do want to bring it to your attention now um, It could because it's more indicative of the neuro exam. However, if you felt like you needed to perform this exam, it would be part of your abdominal exam because you are there in the abdominal area. With the abdominal reflex exam, this is telling you the condition of T8 to T10 and also T10 to T12. You want your person or your patient to lay supine and again with knees slightly bent so we're not overextending the abdominal muscles. You're gonna use the handle of the reflex hammer, so the opposite silver end or the metal end, and you're gonna stroke the skin in the direction that's shown here upwards. Um, you see that on the schematic. You're going to move from each corner toward midline. And what you should notice is epsilateral contraction of that abdominal wall or the abdominal muscle. And you might see a slight deviation of the umbilicus that moves toward the stroke. So again, you are going to move towards midline in two different areas. And then the purple arrow, arrows are actually showing you where you should see the reflex occurring. That abdominal muscle should be moved up um, and you might see the umbilicus moving up as well. The chromosteric reflex tells you the condition between L1 and L2 and it's not routinely done. The times that I've done the chromosteric reflex, it was to rule out testicular torsion. And you can see that you would only use this reflex on a male patient. You're going to lightly stroke the inner aspect of the thigh with the reflex hammer. You can also use a tongue blade as well. And if you use the reflex hammer, again, you're using the handle of the hammer. You would note a elevation of the epsilateral testicle. And it is not very dramatic. It's very subtle. Uh, what this tells you uh, and, and why I use it for testicular torsion is usually if this testicle is swollen and edematous and torturous, you will not get that reflex. And lastly, we have the plantar reflex that we talked about earlier in the slide deck, um, also referred to as the Babinski when you're working with infants. In adults, we call it the plantar reflex. It tells us the condition between L2 and L4. And what we're looking for is while you are uh, lightly stroking the sole of the foot, remember you're making an inward motion across the ball of the foot. It looks like an upside down J, starting from the heel moving up to the toes. And what you're looking for is the plantar flexion. You want the toes to move inward. There should be some inversion and flexion of the forefoot. The last couple concepts I want to remind you of is the Glasgow Coma Scale and how to do neurological checks or rechecks. The Glasgow Coma Scale you might be familiar with if you watch any type of medical drama on TV and you have a patient that comes in and, and the EMT or the emergency room physician says, you know, Glasgow Coma Scale of three, or they might say GCS of four. Um, what they're talking about is this Glasgow Coma Scale. And we use it to determine eye-opening response, motor response, and verbal response. And by looking at the scale, you can see that a GCS of three or four is actually not good and uh, your patient has poor neurological responses. Whereas the highest you can get is a GCS of 15. So at the level of consciousness, you're making sure your person is A and O to person, place, and time. You're looking for motor response, whether they are able to 
have extension, inflection, localized pain, or maybe they open up their eyes with command. And then lastly, the verbal response. You want to see if their speech is appropriate, their sounds are appropriate, and how they are communicating. And I think I might have skipped one, um, the eye opening response. And so you want to see if they open their eyes to speech, to pain spontaneously, or if there's even a response at all. The next slide here is a visual representa a representation of the Glasgow Coma Scale for visual learners. I think that this slide is really helpful to see what you are looking for in your GCS. We'll go over quickly the charting or documentation for the neurological exam, and then that will be the end of the slide deck. So subjectively, you can write no usual frequent or severe headaches, no head injury, dizziness, or vertigo, seizures or tremors, no weakness, numbness, tingling, no difficulty swallowing or speaking, and your patient does not have a history of stroke, spinal cord injury, meningitis, or alcoholism. As far as the sample charting for the cranial nerves, we see here that we start with your mental status exam. So you're going to talk about appearance, behavior, speech, um, whether your patient's cognition and thought processes are intact. And then you'll go through the cranial nerves one through 12, and you will chart these specifically. So for one, for instance, identifies coffee and peppermint. Two, their vision is 20-20 on the left and the right. Peripheral fields are intact by confrontation and the fundi exam is normal. Cranial nerves three, four, and six. Um, extraocular movements are intact. There's no ptosis, nystigmus. Pupils are equal around reactive to light and accommodation, or you can write perla. Cranial nerve five, sensation intact and equal bilaterally, jaw strength equal bilaterally. Seven, facial muscles intact and symmetric. Eight, hearing, using the whispered words test, they can hear bilaterally. If you have to do Weber's, you can say tone is heard midline without lateralization. And then you can also do uh, Renee's test as well. And you would want to say air conduction is greater than bone conduction. With cranial nerves 9 and 10, swallow intact, gag reflex is present, uvula rises midline on pronation, 11, shoulder shrug, head movement intact and equal bilaterally, and lastly, cranial nerve 12, the tongue protrudes midline, there's no tremors. For motor, you can put no atrophy, weakness, there's no tremors, your patient's gait is smooth and coordinated, able to perform tandem walking, Romberg's sign is negative, rapid alternating movements or RAM. Uh, you can use finger to nose or finger to finger. Um, this is intact and smooth. For sensory, you can say your patient can feel pinprick, light touch, vibration is intact. Stereognosis, able to identify key. You can also talk about graphiesthesia where they can identify the letter or the number on their palm. And lastly, reflexes, they're normal, the abdominal superficial reflex, no Babinski sign, or you can say panter, plantar reflex is intact. Deep tendon reflexes, all two plus and equal bilaterally with, um, and then down going toes is talking about the plantar reflex. If there's any negative, or excuse me, positive or abnormal findings in the DTRs and you wanna separate them out specifically and grade them individually.